Hi, I am Dustin Luke Nelson, uh, writer of Magda Skeleton Maker. You can find me on Twitter at DLuke Nelson, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a new guest to the show. It's always wonderful to have new people that come on the show because we are joined today by the ever-talented Dustin Luke Nelson, creator of Magda Skeleton Maker. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Anytime, anytime. So for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talk. Yeah, so I am a writer, got a couple poetry collections, do comics. Uh, I'm also senior writer at Thrillist, where I cover food and travel and some comic book stuff. Right now, I'm, I have a new first issue of a three-issue miniseries called Meg the Skeleton Maker up on Kickstarter. We're kind of in the final stretch here uh probably about nine days left when uh, this airs uh and it's created with the artist donna black whose work's just i'm in love with uh and the letter or letter squids who i also just does excellent work if you I'm sure you've seen their name pop up in comics before so what is so important about this particular series and why did you want to make it ah, that's a good question <laughs> you know, when you get lost in creative projects you it's easy to forget the origin and like how this all started and the reason behind it is you're like getting through the nitty-gritty of it donna and i had wanted to do a project together for a little bit we talked about it i mean it's almost been five years now probably kind of bouncing ideas off each other talking every now and then and so there were kind of two parts of the creation of this and one was donna's art and wanting to work with her uh just kind of loving how she creates these mixed media comic pieces and art uh, and trying to tailor an idea I was interested in a little bit to her work and something that kind of really showcased her style. And the other half was, was it's a story. It's just kind of been an itch I've wanted to scratch for a while. Magda is a semi young woman who has at times seat her vision goes into this like static and she has difficulty navigating the world visually. She lives at a bit of a remove from people and protects herself because of this. Some things happen, <laughs> as you <laughs> vaguely describe things without spoiling anything. Uh, and she sees some neighbors doing a sort of ritual and sees this kind of lightish portal open up. This being made of light comes out of it that she calls the light beast. And so there's a supernatural aspect to it, but also I think at the heart of it too is this Magda kind of coming to a new understanding of who she is, but also this feeling of, what do you do now? <laughs> she sees this, but no one else sees it. And she can only see it at the time she sees static. So there's difficulty of saying like, okay, this is happening. This is dangerous. This is, as, as, there's something I need to tell you, but you really have to believe me <laughs> because no one else can see it. And I can only see it sometimes. And so there is this aspect of like, I mean, you can't really, what are you going to call the cops and tell them <laughs> I've, sometimes see a demon probably doesn't go over super well or give you the results you want so she is in this like state of needing people to believe her and to understand her in a way that's really difficult i think to lesser extents hopefully not living murderous demons or anything uh we all kind of experience you know there's this need to understand each other and and feel that belief in yourself and and in others to like get behind them to build some kind of community and um that kind of is at the heart of her dilemma at the start of the series it sounds like when you were working with donna that you were exploring some pretty deep themes it almost sounds like you were diving into mental health in some aspects i could be completely wrong though. you know it wasn't something we discussed in those terms certainly um but I know Donna's very open and talks about mental health a lot. So maybe it was of interest to her. And, you know, it's something I, I'm interested in, too. And I think, uh, you know, when you have what, you know, I hope are fully fleshed out characters, you, you know, you, it's something we all, well, a lot of people deal with and struggle with and becomes, you know, to a greater and lesser extent, a part of who we are and how we navigate the world. And, and how, you know, I think if you're going to empathetically understand other people especially if 
characters and stories are part of that other people, like something you need to, uh, you know, consider and spend time with. So then throughout this entire process, working with Don and of course your letter as well too, what was the hardest part for you to deal with the beginning, the middle or the end of this creative process? I think I'm a little bit still in the middle. We're still in art. You know, as far as like the, the writing, I, for me often, I find the middle <laughs> maybe not the most popular answer because it's very nitty gritty, but the middle is the, you know, the thing I think you end up spending the most time with for endings for me come from the understanding of the character and kind of seeing how they push their way through this world and how they, you know, make mistakes and try to correct them in their sloppy ways. And I start often with the beginning uh, because I, the concept kind of dictates a beginning for me. Um, and it's so easy in the middle, I think, to be like, all right, I got to connect these dots and this happens and this happens and going back and like, no one wants to read a story that feels like this happens and this happens and this happens. Uh, and, you know, finding that connective tissue. And uh, one thing I, I just was reading some of uh, Matt Bell's work, novelist and professor who I met long ago and was just picked up another one of his books recently and <laughs> was talking a lot about how a uh, setting in the middle of a story really kind of shifts in unexpected ways and there's interesting ways to think about that if you return to the same spaces over and over that like you're a different person when you re-enter the space you interact with it differently the space can be different like your house can burn down and that's a different experience like going back to a burned down house but also when you change it changes the spaces around you and i think that's a, a interesting way to look at a lot of those middle the, the meat scenes of stories of there's extreme versions of like you go off to college and come back to your childhood home and like what does that feel like this is a different space now it has different connective tissue to your life i enjoy that middle stuff but it also takes me like you know, come back to this and like okay well what's the heart of this situation what's that like more nitty-gritty like interact emotional stuff instead of the uh you know giant sword battle at the end <laughs> i was gonna say those, those could be fun too it sounds quite fit here <laughs> your narrative currently. Then, you know, character development is always interesting because, and you spoke on it as well too, and this is something I haven't really dived into too much with other creative people in general because usually they, they discuss it. But what makes a good character in, in your opinion and how do you think the characters that are being created today, especially in today's context, are being resonated with the people that read them? You know, I, I think, you know, at that basic writing level, you are old cliches of like you're looking for change in a character uh you know whether that comes from within or is something kind of forced upon them but i think you still need surprise in that i i, I think readers are really smart you don't always have to connect all these dots and readers expect this kind of change and but i also think they want to see authenticity in that change not creators checking off the list of things that a story needs you know, even when your own life, when you change it, that involves surprise, things that are just like unexpected. And I, I've talked about this before, but I there's a moment in Stranger Things that I think of a lot when I think about character development or in that, in that moment of change. Um, in the first season when Steve Harrington goes to apologize, yeah, he's constructed at the beginning is this kind of meat heady character who is going to be flat and you're never going to see anything from and then he's going to ch apologize to will's brother and you're like this is an unexpected change in him like mm -hmm. he's trying to grow he has accepted this change and he knocks on the door and gets inside and his girlfriend is with the guy he's going to apologize <laughs> to and immediately we've got a different kind of change like wait what's going on am i angry what am i feeling i thought i was doing the right thing and then the monsters in there and you have another kind of change happening and he's got to accept that this is a thing that exists and he wanted to punch this guy but now maybe i need to help save them and i thought it was just like a really smart moment of change for a character that kind of is at the heart of who that character becomes for the rest of the series but it does those things for readers uh, of this show there's that change and you're not totally stunned someone would apologize and you're not totally stunned that oh well she's there we knew this there's some dramatic irony taking place then being forced into this third moment of change and you're like wow this is like a shift that that's dramatic and dynamic and you kind of feel it in the end as he's like processing all this and i don't think we all need to take a baseball bat to a monster to experience change. I think that's a lot of, it embodies some of that, uh, what I think 
makes character development really interesting when it's done well and in what you hope for. And I think it is, it's totally different in comics, especially as a reader, you want that kind of stuff. But you know, if you're reading like Marvel or DC, how much you expect Batman to change uh, <laughs> when we're fairly familiar with the, the tropes of what he is and surprise his parents died. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, spoiler alert. Jeez. Uh, you know. I should have marked that. Uh, he could edit that out. <laughs> I don't want anyone to know that. So yeah, I think there, there's just unique challenges in comics too with that. Cause you, you know, you're going panel by panel. You need visual. You have very few words to do this. Uh, you know, as a writer, it is I think you have to be able to communicate that change well with your collaborators, so that you're both kind of on the same page. And you know, and just all the little details about people that make them them. And just those, yeah. You know, and that that's kind of part of what's exciting about comics too. And that collaboration process from a creator's point of view, to me, is coming together to find the heart of a character. Because a lot of those details, and I'm sure you've got tons of examples you can think of, of, you know, it's not something someone wrote down that helps define this character, but it's this little thing they grab. It's, it's oh, a man. series I have recently loved was die. All these kids are who they are and you get some character details to them, but when they're transported to this kind of dungeons and dragons world, they didn't know existed. Their characters start to embody some of what makes them unique. You see it on them. Like they're just tiny details that the artist has added that say, oh, you know, this is kind of who this character is. This is, you know, some of the visual cues that help bring that story together. And, and seeing those kind of collaborative things in process for yourself is exciting too, as you get to, I, I think I have a good grasp of this character. And for me in, in this process, like the way Donna drew Magda standing like by a bus stop or the way she is, her job is assembling skeletons in a factory and the way she like is holding some bones or just these little things that you go, okay, you know what? I think I understand this character a little bit more. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for me, that's an exciting collaboration when I'm writing this character and it comes back to me and you're like, oh, you understood this aspect of this character. And I, uh, maybe I don't really get to it until page three, but you brought in this posture, this feeling that becomes embodied so early on. You mentioned Marvel and DC. So then what is your creative kryptonite? Ooh. That's tough. <laughs> uh, you know, I think I really thrive on kind of the energy of ideation. I love that uh, you know, having those discussions or even if it's just like the storyboarding process or outlining for me, I get like a ton of energy from that. and can be, you know, it, it, for any creative person, you know, I think it's can be easy to get that initial spark, start something, and then to keep going can be harder. And I think a lot of people hit a wall on that. And I, I enjoy that process of keeping going, but I like that uh, spark so much <laughs> that uh, I tend to, you know, my kryptonite is just wanting to like, keep going all the time. I'm like, oh, you know what? I've got another idea. I could, I all write 10 comics at the same time. You know, just like that energy feels good. I love that, that, uh, that part of the process. So that kryptonite for me might just be trying to do too many things at once. I uh, have notes on a ton of stuff. Like, oh, you could do this and this. And, you know, comics is a slower process. You know, we would, in your collab well, any collaborative process can be in uh, taking that time and being like, no, all right, that's fine. Put those notes away. Uh, we'll get to the next comic. We'll get to the next story. We're going to do this, but focus in that that, that energy has got to sit back for a second you you've opened up the next can for the next question how many unfinished scripts do you have oh <laughs> i don't even know Ball, uh, ballpark it <laughs> i mean i've <clears throat> also write short stories so sometimes i have a lot of stuff that's kind of in my big ideas folder that i keep that's like I'm not sure what's a short story, what's a comic yet. Um, I've written a couple short films, and some of them times it goes that way. Uh, but you know, there's probably a good like twenty ish that are uh, in somewhat developed into an outline. Um, yeah, there's just a big pile of them, uh, and a lot of them probably don't deserve to make it out outside of that folder. Uh, 
but that's, you know, I think part of the process too is getting really excited about this and then coming back to it a month later and being like, oh, there's not a story there. You just like liked this character for a second, or, uh, which is great. It's, I, I like that too. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot in there. That that's the hardest part about being creative. You have so many ideas, so many concepts, and you only have a fine finite amount of time. And it's like you want to do everything you possibly can, but you you know you won't be able to. Yeah, and I think in some ways you you have to be an editor of yourself. You are an editor sitting there at a magazine with these stories. Which of these do you very much not want in the magazine? Because <laughs> that's you know part of the process. No one, uh, the greatest creators in the world, they, you know. There's a lot of garbage in there that before you hit that gem that's worth all of this and that has the depth that's worth getting into and is more than just like, oh, it's kind of a cool idea because skill you're always developing how to edit yourself. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being a writer that maybe the general public doesn't realize? You know, I'm uh, of the mindset that I think the thing that's misunderstood is that anyone can do it. And I think there's varying degrees of that. Like, I'm not saying anyone can be you know, Cormac McCarthy or Joan Didion or anything. People are storytellers. Like it's part who humans are. We tell stories all the time. And I, you know, talk to friends who are lawyers or, you know, just that do other things outside of what we traditionally kind of call creative media or creative careers. Uh, even though I, I think often they're underselling their creativity, you know, they tell stories all the time, you know, and I think, anyone can really do that i think the surprising part is often for people that just that it's work it's work it's sitting down every day it's you know being okay with having done that work and throwing it away and those ideas we were talking about of like spending weeks on something and being like you know what i just don't think there's enough there or i haven't developed this right maybe i need to set it aside for six months and come back to it you know and i write daily for work that too you know it's just work you're sitting down to do it and having some discipline. And I think that's, maybe that's two answers to your question, but I think everyone's capable of telling stories. You know, that was, my grandfather wasn't a writer. He was a farmer. And, uh, but what everyone knew about him was he told stories. Like that was what he did. He sat around the table drinking coffee and telling stories. And I think everyone has that in them, but also then the other side of that is like, if you want to do that story, yeah, it, it's work. It takes a lot of hours and a lot of failure. And then when you think it, gone well there's a lot of failure involved again uh and rejection and all, all the things that come along with any creative career i, I definitely believe everyone's got stories in them and, and the capability of doing it that doesn't always mean there's a big audience for those stories but i think people are capable of it for sure so then how do you think the birth of creativity was formed wow we're going deep down the rabbit hole not yet soon <laughs> You know, I don't know. I, I think so much of what, you know, we call like creative careers and stuff, as I alluded to, that, that it's really just like part of us, you know, like we are drawn to art in a lot of ways and to storytelling and to music and rhythm, visual storytelling from cave paintings. And I think it's just, I don't know if we'd be able to find a birthplace of these things as much as just more evidence that it's just kind of part of how we communicate and how we understand the world. Almost any career people have, if you enjoy your work or to whatever extent, uh, are pieces of your work, not the filing that might be involved or uh, filling out forms, but that there's creativity involved in that. I mean, if you're a grant writer, that's just, a, it's a skill you're communicating, you're telling stories, you're a politician, you're telling stories, you know, if technology or writing code, I mean, I look at that and I'm like, it's when people do this, it's beautiful. And you're like this repetition, there's rhythm, there's, you know, you're telling a story, it becomes visual. Uh, there's creativity in all that. And I think, you know, people who, a lot of, I won't speak for everyone, but I, I think a lot of people who are satisfied in the things they do uh, are using their creativity and making it a part of their lives, even if they don't acknowledge it. Whatever. My mom writes grants and I, I don't know that she'd be like, I have a creative career, but I, you know, to write a grant or write anything, I mean, you're using those things if you enjoy it and are good at it. So I think it just kind of 
you know, part of who we are. <laughs> I have friends who uh, sell like vintage clothing and I'm always like, you're, you're a curator, you know, mm-hmm. you're looking at this, all the stuff and saying, what can I put together that people are interested in? How does this speak to people? And there's just a ton of creativity involved in that. Yeah. And I think that's, it's just part of us and it's something we need. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh. Man, good question. Yeah, I, I was always reading and I started writing when I was like six or seven was just like writing horrible stories that, you know, either we were in like Napster internet. So there wasn't really like online communities of writing and things. There was, you know, good tie up the phone line and spend six hours downloading a song that wound up not being what it's on the label. Um, uh, so I think some of what I was probably doing at that age was probably called fan fiction at this point. I'm like, mm-hmm. uh, if I could find those notebooks, I don't want anyone to find those notebooks. <laughs> um, but uh, I can re- I remember like that feeling good when I felt like I'd completed stories. Uh, which I'm sure weren't completed and weren't good and were barely stories. But, uh, you know, I felt something in that and and felt like an energy from it that I think was probably one early example. Uh, I also like, pretty vividly remember uh, moving to Pittsburgh with my family uh, just before I started kindergarten and we, uh, I could read and going into the kindergarten class and on my second day, the teacher calling my parents in and she like yelled at them because I could read and they're like what 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 are you what do you what do you what and she's like well what am I supposed to teach him and I was like even then I I wasn't fully processing the like nuances of this interaction but I could feel this like oh like there's something special about reading and I don't quite understand what it is because none of the situation makes sense. It still doesn't make sense as an adult, uh, but could feel that there was like some power in that and that, that, you know, I had accessed something that was somehow adult. Uh, she made it feel forbidden. My parents did a good job of being like, that was not great. Whatever was happening there didn't make any sense. Don't worry about it. It gave me this sense that like even adults knew that there's like something special about reading and about that uh, communication. That's the spot I'm going with. <laughs> Is there anything that I haven't touched on that you'd like to, to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? Really, uh, you know, focused in on Magda right now, but we also uh, had a, you know, a story I'm really proud of. I did with the artist Sam Prowse that's in the uh, new Twisting Time anthology uh, mm-hmm. that came out maybe February. Uh, and we have a 12 page sci fi story in there that uh, called Planet Now. That was uh, really exciting to me. It was, and it's something we're still talking about because it's a kind of time travel thing with like a scientific basis, but also trying to break that a little bit and be like, yeah, but we don't, this is that, but twisted. So we don't understand what's going on anymore. And that was a really exciting project. And I love Sam's art too. He's a, just a really great, fun artist. Uh, and I love working with him. And the other thing, Thrillist, I mean, for comics readers, one of the things I do is I do our best comics of the year list. Mm -hmm. So that's an ongoing process. We update it throughout the year. And I think we have an update that probably is coming the week this comes out. Um, And I I get excited about that. Uh, I'm not necessarily someone who like thrives on reading lists or anything, but I, I... you know, I put a ton of work into this and read so much for it. And it, it's exciting to me just because it, it gives me the opportunity to read a lot of stuff I might not have picked up at the comic book shop otherwise. People recommend or just, I haven't read anything that looks like that this year. Like, I'm, I should do that. We all have internal biases. and It gives me a good reason to try and fight against those and, you know, just say like, okay, if this all starts feeling the same or I'm reading too many people that just are writing like this or not of different experiences that it it just really prompts me to make sure like, okay, like you got to, you got to diversify your reading. You got to look all over the place and find, because I said, everyone's got stories that are worth hearing. And uh, that's exciting to me. Like I I just, I've wound up reading a lot of stuff that I think I probably wouldn't have read otherwise better writer and reader because of it. I think that's also a, don't take lightly that I have the opportunity to share that with people. 
and share that experience and share the work of others that is, you know, exciting to me. Um, so I, I do get excited about that because I know it's something that people look at and, and just opportunity to share some things people might not have found otherwise, which, you know, it's pretty special. I mean, I, I definitely am grateful for getting to do that kind of thing. I, I love getting to share other people's work. Exactly what the show is all about when I started in 2008, literally. It's just, you know, there's so many creative people that I would never have known of if they didn't come on the show. I, I'm thankful for the other people like you who do this kind of thing. Cause it's, it's how I find those two. And, you know, <laughs> when I'm looking for something and like, oh, I, I just haven't read anything like this. You know, you look at other people who really care about sharing the work of others and curation in that way. Even just the people at the comic book shop, I definitely like go to my uh, shop, comic book college near me, uh, and I'll often just book them. And I'm like, what am I not reading that I am absolutely missing out on? The people I like asking that kind of question to are the one whose eyes light up and are like, yeah, I got some stuff for you. I know what you haven't been reading. And they're like, yeah, I love that excitement. I'll, let's take it and run. I'll, I'll uh, you know, so and you forget about it even sometimes. I try not to, but just how much that kind of thing influences you. Like I've you know, been reading Nottingham from uh, Mad Cave since that started last year. That was definitely one that I, you know, they were on issue three and a dude in my comic book shop was like, you got to read this. He was right. It's great. I love it. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Ooh. As far as just the baseline of like, sure, keep doing this. Like, you know, it was, it was a lot of family. Um, definitely had parents who were like, yeah, do whatever you want. Like, uh, you want to write, you want to play music. That's great. Let's do this. Uh, and that kind of just baseline of just having that. So that I'm grateful for that. Just that was, I didn't know a different thing. It was just like, Hey, yeah, go for it. Do do that thing. Um, and I mentioned to, uh, you know, I think unbeknownst to me, probably uh, that a grandfather was a part of that too. Cause he was just a storyteller and I knew like, Oh yeah. Like there's just telling stories. That's uh that's part of what people enjoy uh, and makes like, you know, we should all just sit around and tell each other stories early on. I definitely uh, as like a young person, starting to read I, I read comic books and also was reading like you know some n <laughs> nothing stunning like you know Lord of the Rings and uh, a lot of like fantasy and sci-fi stuff as well as uh, a lot of poetry that I think all of those combined kind of pushed me to it and I think part of me was like oh comics this is fun this is for kids was it kind of always in my mind and I got into like poetry and was reading like the Odyssey and Shakespeare like way too young uh, <laughs> to really know what I was doing. But I think William Blake actually was like one I went to that was like, okay, you're reading something adult, you know, at way too young of an age and then feeling probably pompous in my head about it. But seeing like him doing art and poetry was definitely something that made me go, okay, you know what? Like maybe, this, like combining art and words isn't just for kids. Um, but there's a lot more to this. Uh, actually, <laughs> William Blake sitting right here, coincidentally, just grab some from the library. But yeah, there's definitely part of that too. From a professional standpoint, you are a successful person as a journalist, a writer, and of course, a, a person of poetry and many other creative endeavors that you've done in the past. And you have a currently you have a Kickstarter campaign ongoing that's doing very well. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? You know, I, I struggle with that a lot, uh, which is, I am reminded by friends and my uh, wife that that's probably a uh, side effect of like depression and anxiety and things. Cause I, I never really do, but I do try to, uh, I, I fall prey to the very, like uh, the kind of thing where we're comparing ourselves to other people when that's just like kind of silly and not, you know, I, I want, and try to be a person just excited for other people for their projects and i like to support friends uh, and go see their concerts and i buy their books and I, you know i i believe all, all boats rise kind of thing you know like no one else's success is going to hurt you uh it, it's only good and, and i want the best for those people but i you know there's a part of me that always looks in and says oh you know but 
you're not actually doing a good job with this. And so I try to be someone who can step back and be like, you know, I'm super grateful for all the stuff I get to do. You know, as a kid, I just wanted to be able to spend my days writing and I do it. I get paid to write. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, super lucky for that. It's hard to see, I think. Uh, and I'm sure that's the case for people who are wildly successful and people who are, but uh, it can be hard to see yourself with clear eyes. So I don't know. I, I, you know, struggle with it and just try to be happy and grateful for all the opportunities I get. Cause it's, you know, it's a privilege to be able to do something like this Kickstarter project is, you know, just lucky to be able to do that kind of thing. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh man, got plenty of them. <laughs> well, I showed at one point and wanted to, I, uh, at the time was, uh, writing and producing, a comedy podcast in New York that was live staged and we had guests come on. It was called radio happy hour and it was a ton of fun. We did a tour and, um, for a bit, we played with the idea of an X show just being talking to people about the, all the failures they've had and just nothing but that, uh, especially with successful people and being like, Hey, come tell us about everything that didn't work. Uh, cause it's hard. Like when things go poorly, you know, for anyone and anything, I but I feel a lot of like, that's hard uh, when things don't go right. And it definitely happens, but it's also, you know, when you can have the clarity to step back and say, failure is part of the process. It can feel good. And it's just absolutely true. Anyone who does something successfully has a bunch of failures along the way, whether you're Abraham Lincoln or, you know, a, a writer or artist you can't expect to uh, sit down and do something and that, have that first time just produce a diamond. You got to work those. And I think uh, even when you accept that, though, I mean, it's still, I, I think it's just hard for anyone to, because you have the stuff you've thrown away and you're like, this time, though, I've got the failure behind me and this one's going to be great. Uh, and you're like, oh, no, this one goes in that pile, too. Definitely had that. I've had screenplays that I sat with producers on and was like had worked on forever and they're like yeah we want to do this it's even hired to do one and you know none of it ever did you wear and you're like oh geez like what what happened here uh you know I definitely screwed this up I wasted an opportunity I, I did this wrong but there's also that aspect of yes failures are part of that process a part of getting what you want but it's also uh you know some of it's just out of your control you didn't find the right audience it didn't come at the right time uh you also have to try to i think accept some of that's just nothing you can do about it the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way and the fact that you have the younger generation with you currently in your kids you're inspiring them in some way shape or form whether it's as maybe a writer or a, a creative person in some endeavor in the future who knows what they'll do creatively how can they inspire the generation that follows them that is another good question. Uh, you know, and like, I think actually like a really important one because it's hard to see yourself like grouped with other people and of a generation or a time, but we all are. I, I really think it's just all about being true to yourself and honest with yourself because that's what people want to see and create something that you think is true and honest and you know, expresses yourself. And it does influence people. It's totally true. And you, even if I don't remember everything I saw in those, like, you know, that inspires you. And as that passes through generations, it's not necessarily that they're going to, people will ape your aesthetic or your stories or anything, but being vulnerable and, and giving that little slice of yourself can inspire people to do the same. And to feel at home, you know, in their bodies, in their stories, to feel that they're valid, no matter what their story is, that is important. That's, if you can have any, any little piece of uh, inspiration you pass on to people that is along those lines, I, mean, I think that's anyone would have to consider that a huge success because that is too on the nose. But like, that's, you know, one thing art can do, you know, especially with hard news kind of coming rapid fire. Uh, right now and over recent years, making sure people know that their stories are valid, that they deserve to be heard, and that people will listen 
and care about them. Uh, yeah, that's that's powerful. If your life was a film or a comic book, whatever the medium may be, what would its title be? And because I like music, what would its soundtrack be? Ooh. That is too exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I've had a, a kind of running joke with my wife about uh she said my uh tombstone should we should put he was an inspiration to his people but as a joke <laughs> which so it has like a real royal tenenbaum kind of vibe like no not really so i always i've liked that because i think it's a uh, maybe it sounds pompous but I, I like the uh idea of it being a joke <laughs> and if i could pick anything to soundtrack a story in my life i'd probably pick godspeed you black emperor mm. I'd want Sun, maybe, because uh, I love Sun. Man, a whole movie of their music as a soundtrack might be a little little intense. We'd all be pretty tired by the end of that. So let's go with Godspeed, you Black Emperor. Well, Dustin, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I loved it. We had a great conversation. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where's the Kickstarter and uh, wherever else we can support you online? Yeah, to find the Kickstarter, you can search Magda, M-A-G-D-A on Kickstarter. It comes up. We also have a bit.ly link. It's bit.ly slash Magda dash skeleton. Otherwise, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at D Luke Nelson. Uh, and we've got Kickstarter links on there to make it easy to find. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm on there talking about comics all the time. Hey, it's not a bad profession to have, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll accept it. <laughs> well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.